People are now living longer than ever before. In Canada, life expectancy now hovers around 80 years old for men and 84 years old for women. How well do we do supporting people to make the most of those years? Joining us now on New Thinking for a Graying Population, Sue Lance. She is founder and managing director of Collaborative Aging Consultancy and Zaina Kayat, future strategist with home care provider SE Health and an adjunct professor of health sector strategy at the U of T's Rotman School of Management. And we're delighted to have you two with us here tonight for this very timely conversation. And let me just set the table with this. By the year 2036, you both know this, but I didn't. One in four Canadians will be over the age of 65. One in four. So much of the way society looks today is presumably going to have to change if we're going to accommodate that new reality. Zaina, start us off. The design of retirement homes today. How do you think 25 years from now we're going to regard them? So I often uh, think of how we regard that we institutionalize people with mental health. Right? We put them. In, that's what we're going to think about. That you know, we didn't think that older adults could age in their homes. Mm -hmm. If you remember, way back, 10th century, first when people retired, we put them in alms houses, charities funded them, then nursing homes, then funeral homes, mm -hmm. and so that whole um, equation is changing now because the next generation of older adults is not going to age. Uh, the way their grand their parents did and their grandparents did. Why, in which case, then historically, have we designed the system the way we have designed it? We weren't living as long, number mm. one. So we went into a retirement home for a few years before we may have gone into a long-term care or nursing home and passed away. But now, with 30 years of longevity, mm. the the institutional model of retirement homes doesn't make any sense. And people want to be part of communities. They want to be part of neighborhoods. They want to they want to be closer to different generations. So we're going to look back on retirement homes and say, that was a model that worked when we were living there for two or three years. But it's not a model that works for our oh, generation yes, yeah. uh, who are aging. You'd almost add, you could challenge this word retirement. I mean, yes, in Germany created definitely. it when the mm -hmm. average age you know, of, of death was 65. So the age of retirement was 65, yes. but it's just not that anymore. Uh, Joseph Coughlin, who's kind of a guru on this from the MIT Aging Lab, mm -hmm. He says, actually, it's 28 years of life after retirement will be the norm. That's like, think about from zero to 28, how much happened in your life, mm -hmm. right? That's yes. an entire lifetime is now what used to happen in, yeah, four or five years. So yeah. you two are singularly responsible for redesigning the entire way we go forward from now. <laughs> Absolutely. And so you're both going to have to tell me where, how, how are the designs for senior living going forward going to have to change. Start us off. Well, uh, it, my, my premise is this. We will not change the designs of the, the models for seniors unless we, and I now am 60, uh, boomers, actually engage in the thinking of what we want. We need to co-design the solutions. Mm -hmm. We can't wait for the suppliers to generate the options for us. We have to step in. We have to nudge ourselves. We have to get use our 60s to think about our 80s. And so, uh, sustaining ourselves into our 80s and thriving is is as as Ferris saying we're not going to retire. The essence of successful aging is actually contributing. So how are we going to contribute? Well, we're not going to contribute by living in an institutional setting. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna contribute by customizing the neighborhoods we want to live in and contributing to the operating of those neighborhoods and, uh, and helping one another. Caregiving is the future. We're going to rely on our friends as well as family members and neighbors as caregivers. We're going to receive and give help. So we have to co-design. We have to step in. Okay, and that's hard to do. That. What do those new, yeah. newly designed collaborative neighborhoods look like? So I'll give a few uh, examples. So I'm a future strategist. We spend our time looking all over the world to see how others are adapting to aging and then figuring out what can't translate here, testing them with people and their families. Uh, we actually are writing a book called The Future of Aging. I'll be, we'll be back on this show, Steve, to talk <laughs> about it. Chapter one of The Future of Aging book uh, is called The Future of Senior Living Communities. So in there, we outline these eight kind of concepts that are emerging that we're seeing in Europe and uh, in California and a few pockets of Canada. So just a couple examples. Please. You know, one is like dementia villages, right? Mm -hmm. Or other villages where the whole city is for a population that has some common feature. It could be autism, it could be disability. These have been around 25, 30 years in the Netherlands. I just understand this. Does that mean everybody who lives in that village has autism or dementia? Yeah, or dementia, or yeah. 
Yeah. And we've had delegations from Canada go down and visit these, mm -hmm. particularly in Denmark, uh, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. The first dementia village in Canada is opening up in British Columbia, and the first in the United States just opened in California. So we're about two decades <laughs> behind. Yeah. It's a very interesting concept where you rethink everything, the built environment, the housing, the, the care, care, everything. Facility. That's just one of these kind of eight concepts we explore in our book. Mm -hmm. Okay, just on the face of that, having everybody, and sorry, how many people would live in a dementia village? It could range from 500 into the thousands. Okay, I, I mean, the obvious question is, can you imagine 500 to 1,000 people all with dementia living in a single neighborhood? Village? A single village? I mean, I, I'm guessing a lot of people can't. But that How's doesn't mean work? that it's only people with dementia. A lot of those dementia villages have younger people participating, students living in the, in the village part-time, caregiving. T uh, there's sort of intergenerational amenities, like the retail spaces in those villages. Mm -hmm. So it's not completely um, exclusive. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, we, we, we can design villages to be sort of single purpose, if you will, for a specific population. I'm also interested in the multi-generational and multi-dimensional villages. Talk more about that. Multi-generational meaning what? Well, meaning young families with seniors and uh, and middle-aged people living all in one village and and sharing facilities like kitchens and uh, gardens and the co-housing movement that is certainly well established in Denmark and Europe and in the States, there's over 50 co-housing communities. These are customized neighborhoods where people can spontaneously connect. And we know that successful aging involves social connections, meaningful social connections. And so these village formats of organizing how we live and where we live are the way of the future. Can I just, let's put a little more meat on this bone here. Are we talking very large townhouses where multiple families all live together in the same place? Is that what we're talking so about? So there's, it's all mixed. So mm -hmm. we've been looking at and prototyping and concepting out. Uh, some are cluster living where mm -hmm. uh, you'd have maybe eight pods where you have your own room to sleep in mm -hmm. and everyone shares a central kitchen facility. Mm -hmm. Think of a dorm, you know, maybe right. at a university. Mm -hmm. Others could be three or five family single unit, like an apartment, and then single, you know, unit apartments. Could be in a townhouse complex, could be tall, could be wide. There's lots of combinations depending on zoning, depending on cost. I just want to come back to the intergenerational. Unlike dementia villages, which Canada is just kind of scratching the surface, let's mm -hmm. say, and again, they've been around 25, 30 years in Europe. Um, this concept of too much house, so instead of designing mm. completely, you know, older adults who have a lot of house don't want to leave their house, which mm. is great. And then there's students or others who need house who can help. So there's now programs that are government enabled, including a few just announced in Toronto in the last few months, that will connect those two together. So you have a win-win. So now you've got, you're solving a senior's housing and care problem. But student housing is another problem mm -hmm. for a different, you know, so the two come together. Well, okay, that, that sounds lovely. Can I push back on that a little bit? <laughs> sure, okay. Okay, because uh, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I know lots of seniors who don't want kids around. And I know lots of kids who are, you know, not thrilled with the idea of living with octogenarians. Yeah, right. So is this really going to work? Well, it, one size does not fit, yeah. fit mm -hmm. all. And I think it's a subjective decision. There are lots of seniors who do like living with one another, and there are seniors co-housing projects too, and seniors communities, and, and some retirement communities and, uh, have been built around the idea of adult lifestyle. So there is a need for choice. There's a need for a continuum. Uh, but I think you can't, you, we can't sort of one size fits all, as I say. You've got to customize. And this is where you can't customize unless you step in and help design yeah. what you envision for yourself. So I know myself, I'm going to want to live with near other generations. Mm -hmm. I have a dog, I love walking the dog, I love interacting with children. I, I am a volunteer, I want to contribute. So I need the built form that's going to match my, my priorities and my lifestyle. And I think that what we need to do is get boomers thinking along these lines. What is it that they do envision? Some people love to live on the side of a golf course and with other people their age. Fine, that's good too. Uh, but, but we do need to make sure whatever we do, we have the opportunity for social connection because that is the secret sauce of aging well. Go Just ahead. to add on the one size fits all, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one size have, doesn't fit all. What Where? we have today is yeah. a one size fits yes. all. This ah. is the thing. We have not 
yes. innovated on the retirement living model. Exactly. It's, and not just one side, one color, like beige with a little bit of burgundy. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And one pricing. Yes. Right? So what's killed us as a social enterprise 80% of seniors in Canada are on a fixed income, median income, $27,000. They can't even afford, hmm. even if they wanted to go to beige, <laughs> they can't afford it. And so we're looking at, you know, what are these new concepts right. that bring affordability, agency, choice, community. Shared costs. You wouldn't add those mm -hmm. words up together yes. in what's currently on offer. Can right. I add one uh, uncomfortable additional element to this mix, and that is politics? Mm -hmm. You're, you're lo in order to achieve what I think you're talking about here, it's going to require some new thinking at City Hall, some rezoning, some, yes. some allowing yep. things to happen differently than the way they happen now, and NIMBYism has almost never been worse. How are you going to make that happen? I'll tell you, in Toronto, it's happening. You it know, with happening. the housing strategy, mm -hmm. uh, land is being available. There was a great piece of property at Lansdowne and Bloor. West End. Uh, mm -hmm. Only could be, for 600 units, full senior yes. campus, only could be bid on by a nonprofit for seniors for the whole continuum of care. Hmm. And there's many, many more parcels. We've been traveling Ontario and Canada. There's not a single community we visited that didn't say, please build one yesterday for us. Yeah. Uh, any hmm. of the concepts she described, every city wants it. So this is one where I actually yeah. think federal p political is aligned because CMHC has made funding mm -hmm. available at very good rates. Provincial and every single city. I don't know anyone who's against or gonna be in the way of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's show a clip. This is a look at a retirement home in Seattle that is also, apropos of this intergenerational thing, daycare as well. Mm -hmm. Sheldon, if you would. You have to be a grown up sometime. No. No? I don't know if I can do you it. I can't even do it. <laughs> you go. Can you get it in there? Keep working on it. Can I sing? Ave Maria. You know how you, if you love somebody and they give you something, you know how hard it hits you on your heart. <laughs> Hot ones running out of eyes. Sue, so what do we think? Mm, beautiful. This is this is the magic of multi-generational contact. And it can either be in housing or it can also be in communities. There are programs like seniors who volunteer and read in schools with children and form relationships. This is good for seniors, it's good for children. It's good for society. Is it happening in Canada yet? Yes, mm -hmm. in small in small ways, pockets, yeah. small pockets. Um, but I, you know, the idea of customizing back to neighborhoods and communities and buildings. Why not build in a child care center into a into a neighborhood or a, a set of townhouses? There, and we describe those in the co-housing as sort of not sort of high stacked townhouses, but low rise townhouses where there's laneways and community spaces where children can come to daycare and seniors can be volunteering. Zaina, this is the this is the success. I, I, I don't want to be a killjoy here, oh. but that was a lovely clip with nice soft music in the background and <laughs> no children screaming or fighting or crying and no adults, you know, forgive me, dealing with the issues that they may have to yeah. deal with uh, when they get to that age. Um, does that put just a little bit too sweet a picture on the reality of trying to do that? Look, I mean, all this stuff is evidence-based, right? So mm -hmm. I was reflecting, you know, Toronto got very lucky in August of last year, we got to host the International Federation of Aging. This is a very big deal that they chose to bring the world here mm -hmm. to discuss all issues. This intergenerational stuff, you know, was many, many sessions at this conference mm -hmm. uh, with evidence, right? So mm -hmm. you don't just go do it and hope for the best. There's some pretty good evidence. Yeah. And I mean, as Sue is saying, when you design a new way of living, it's very iterative. Mm -hmm. You try something, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You try something else. Mm -hmm. So that's the spirit of this new way of designing living communities instead of, again, 
one size fits all, you get what you get, you mm -hmm. know, pay the monthly rent. What, what are these adult daycare centers that are sort of recreated towns, yeah. like stepping into the past? Can yeah. you describe, describe that for us, maybe? And so again, we have adult daycares here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Memory Center is a great group that we have a lot of time for, and there's many others. So again, you could bring, you know, your loved one could come and spend the day and get um, services and community and all these things, but they don't have to live permanently there. This group in the United States has started these town centers. They're now franchising them across the country in strip malls. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea, and, and I'm not a brain scientist, is that the formative years of aging of the current kind of older adult population is the 40s, the 50s. So they recreate, you know, the malt shop or, you know, the, the movie, uh, the drive-in, and that is the daycare. So they're experiencing mm. life as it was then, and that triggers a whole new set, and it brings healing and therapy. So reminiscence therapy is what it's called. And that's a scalable franchise at a very low cost. Are we late to the party here, though? No. And the day programs you're talking about, or daycare, yeah. I call it a day program. But yeah. these day uh, programs are can be really rich in arts, music, mm -hmm. intergenerational, uh, um, creative work, and that is also so sustaining. But it also, the other dimension to these day program models is that those that are living with someone who they are caring for get a break while that, mm -hmm. where that person goes to the day program. And what, what I've, my research in the caregiving world has, has shown that we have to offer more of these kind of creative uh, solutions, both for the person who wants, needs the program, but also for the caregivers. Mm to give them a break, to sustain caregiving. How does rezoning laneways yeah. mm -hmm. affect this? So it's another, oh, one, of, one. <laughs> it's another one of our eight. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is one where Calgary has a neighborhood that's kind of taken this on, mm -hmm. a bit of, from an academic lens, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, whereas they're very common in California and other places. So think of the coach house. Yeah. That's the other word for mm -hmm. these. So instead of having to have your mother or father go somewhere else, you have a little property on your property with like a mini house for them, so they get independence, but they're close. And again, when you have too much house or too much land and there's a housing crisis, you kind of kill two birds. So this is a growing popularity, mm -hmm. and we've been looking at it to see if there's a play there with a seniors living. Any mm -hmm. of this economically feasible? Sounds expensive. Yeah. Laneway housing? All of the above, everything we've been talking about. Well, actually, the co-housing model is at least on par or less cost for sure, because you're sharing all these amenities and you're even sharing the care. And this is an area uh, that I'm very interested in is rather than one-to-one, -one, a home care worker coming into a person's home mm -hmm. and you pay for that one visit and you pay once yourself, that adds up to $3,000 a month if you need care every day for an hour or two. So if I share or cluster the care, uh, co-care if you will, then that makes this more affordable. So I, I see these solutions as more affordable. Yes, from a real estate point of view, you might have to invest in the laneway housing, but you can also create that laneway housing and have a live-in caregiver situate there. Mm -hmm. And then that allows you a lot, that's a lot less costly model too, the live-in caregiver. So the, the permutations are quite uh, endless, and I think we have to discover them. If the developer doesn't have a business model, then it won't work, of course. Right. So the business yeah. model has to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but again, because the median income is, is a fixed income generally for most Canadian adults, uh, older adults, uh, you know, we are focusing on it has to be affordable or else there is no business yes. model. Where does digital fit into all of this? You want to start on that, well, I'm a futurist, so I guess <laughs> I can take this one. So look, yeah. there's all this mythology around older adults and their um, facility with technology. You know, more people over 55 download apps than people under 20? Come on. Oh, yeah. People under 20 pretty much only know how to text, right? <laughs> older adults yeah. can use an iPad, they can use, a, yeah. you know, so it's just, mm -hmm. there's a lot of data around um, a f uh, use of technology. But as Sue said, there's always a segmentation. Mm -hmm. Just like you might be a Luddite, but I'm not. And, you know, maybe we're in the same <laughs> age you know? category yeah. <laughs> or the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so, so a combination of um, this generation are becoming digital na natives. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they relocate housing, they're expecting internet and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the supply of new technologies to age in place safely with all the monitoring, but not intrusively. Um, so Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas mm -hmm. two weeks ago, 182,000 people. Last year, seniors 
maybe a couple things. This year, entire streams, hundreds and hundreds of innovators, and mm -hmm. we wrote a blog about it. So it is coming. And what kind of stuff? What are they? What are they showing? So everything from sensors in the floors, in the walls, in the sheets that detect. Not that they're watching you 24-7, but where's the pattern not the same? Mm. If grandma every day goes to the bathroom mm -hmm. at 10 o'clock, then makes coffee, then watches Jerry Springer or the agenda, <laughs> um, yes. you know, and then all of a sudden that pattern has now changed, then you can set a, a, th a set of thresholds or alerts and things like that. Mm -hmm. Wandering. Early dementia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Oh, so many sensors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is I think, though, in the practical way, one of the areas that I've uh, looked into is modifying one's home for aging in place mm -hmm. and or modifying one's residence. What does that involve? Well, it can involve everything from stair glides and elevators to uh, small little adaptive things in your kitchen mm -hmm. to make it easier. Or it can include high-tech electronic uh, mirrors that tell you that you're, you're um, behaving differently, looking differently, and Your in skin fact you've looks, got yeah. early dementia. Uh, but I think what we, we do have to get practical too. If we're going to stay in our own homes, what does that take? What are the things, are we living on one level? Is there an entrance way that we can get into easily? All these practical things have to be thought through. And the marketplace ha is providing a lot of those ideas and solutions if we are willing to uh, engage in Embrace that thinking. Mm -hmm. We all know what a renaissance is, but I'm seeing this new term for the first time called the, is it the boomissance? <laughs> is that what you call it? Yeah. Because the boomers are having a renaissance, a yeah. boomissance? Mm -hmm. The future of senior living is going to include a crop of new products, I guess aimed, targeted for this demographic, that we don't even know about right now. Yep. Can, like, can you imagine what that's, what's that going to entail? So, uh, again, Joseph Coughlin just wrote an entire book on this, mm -hmm. so I'm going to mm -hmm. do it justice in 25 seconds. Uh, look, a boomer was born every 10 seconds, okay? In Back two, in the day. In, right? Mm -hmm. But think, in two years, they will turn 75. Right. So, the... the it's just a huge, it's not gradual. Uh, and so uh, if you follow that generation from when they were born, entire new markets and products were created that didn't exist. Hmm. Pediatricians, right. zero to 400,000. <laughs> Fast food, McDonald's was created because of the boomers. Right. Suburbs, boomers. Refrigerators and appliances, <laughs> boomers created that. We don't even know what this yeah. next thing is, but there's a lot of people looking at it. <laughs> That's very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank both of you for coming in tonight and sort of giving us a glimpse of uh, our not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Zaina Kayat and uh, Sue Lance, uh, great to have both of you here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.